Hello, historical geology students. This is the um, um, second video for this week. Uh, all of you, t except for four people, took the test. Uh, the four people who missed the test need to contact me immediately. Um, you can't be missing the test. I gave you uh, several email messages uh, to so that to remind you that you had to take the test, but. Um, I have the grades and over the next couple days I'm going to figure out what the curve is and I'm going to send each of you an email with your uh, uh, a number grade and the number grade will be after the curve. So the good news is you finished three quarters of the class. Now we got one quarter left. Um, for those of you who are doing good, keep up the good work. But for those of you who aren't doing good, you need to be doing the, the following three things. First, you need to watch the videos twice and take good notes. You need to participate in the labs with your lab partners to understand um, how to identify fossils, uh, their, their phylum, their classes, their lifestyles, and also answer all the questions in the labs. And the third thing you need to do is uh, once you're done listening to the videos, uh, go through your book and read about the topics that were covered. In the previous video, which was called video number seven, we talked about the Cambrian period. And the Cambrian period is the first period of the Paleozoic era. We talked about during the Cambrian how there were lots of trilobites. And all of the various phylum, all of the invertebrate phylum and the, and the first vertebrates, fish, appeared during the Cambrian period. We talked about the Burgess Shale in the Cambrian and Archaeocyathid reefs. Now we're going to talk about how life changed for the invertebrates. The next chapter will be about vertebrates. Uh, uh, from the Cambrian to the Ordovician. This picture here is a um, a picture from your book showing you what life was like during the Ordovician. And let me see if I can get a bigger image of that for you here. So this is during the Ordovician. Now, taking a good close look at this picture, I think you can see the difference between the Cambrian to the Ordovician. We have lots of these cephalopods. You can see they've got big, long shells on them. And so during the Ordovician, the cephalopods became quite abundant. These nectonic creatures attacked and killed and ate many of the trilobites. So the trilobites were, they weren't wiped out. They didn't become extinct, but they were drastically reduced in numbers uh, due to this new enemy, the cephalopods. Cephalopods, Phala mollusca, class Cephalopoda. These nectonic creatures um, are hunters. They have uh, tentacles. They have large eyes. And for all the invertebrates, the cephalopods have the best eyesight, almost as good as human eyesight. They could swim quite quickly. Um, and they can capture their prey using these tentacles. They also have a, a beak-like mouth to tear apart their prey. Another thing about the Ordovician is we have lots of these things here, these benthic creatures here, these twig-like uh, organ benthic organisms. These are bryozoa. We talked about that in the earlier video. 
these filter feeding benthic organisms made up most of the reefs during the Ordovician period. So bottom line is during the Cambrian period the reefs were consisted of Archaeocyatha. By Ordovician time the Archaeocyatha had disappeared and the Bryozoans had taken their place to dominate the reefs. So make a note of this in your notes all the, how things change from the Cambrian to the Ordovician and by now you should know what period comes after the Ordovician. Go from Cambrian to Ordovician to what? Well, Silurian is next. So we're going to be talking about the Silurian next. Okay, but before we do, uh, I'm going to show you some other pictures that you need to know. And these little tiny microscopic organisms you might recall belong to phy phylum protozoa. These are phytoplankton. These little microscopic organisms are the most common form of life on planet Earth. They are planktonic. They photosynthesize. And they are considered to be producers in the biological world. Meaning that they produce their own food through photosynthesis. This is what they look like, phytoplankton. During the Ordovician, we have lots of bryozoa and, and also some corals. The photograph on the right shows you a, a horn coral and it's phylum synidria. Most of you all got that right in last week's lab. A few of you didn't get it right. Look at the photo to the right. You can see um, that there's a hole in the very top. That's where the animal lived, the polyp lived, P-O-L-Y-P. And it has a radiating pattern outward from that hole. That belongs to phylum synidria. So during the order vision, the reefs are primarily dominated by bryozoa, but we also had some of your first corals, phylum synidria. Most of you all in lab got these creatures right. These are brachiopods. They're benthic. And when you look at Paleozoic rocks, brachiopods are much more abundant than bivalves. And the way you can tell it's a brachiopod is three things. For brachiopods, one shell is bigger than the other. The brachiopods are usually small. In most cases, less than an inch wide. So, some brachiopods get a little bit larger, but mostly smaller. They're mostly smaller than bivalves. Another thing about brachiopods is there's a beak, a little point where the two shells meet where the hinge, which is called the hinge line. If you're not sure if you're looking at a fossil that has two shells, is it a bivalve or is it a brachiopod? Go look through your lab manual and you can see pictures of different types of brachiopods and bivalves. We talked about these creatures, graptolites, phylum hemichordata, class graptolithinia. These are planktonic organisms. They're quite common in um, Silurian and Devonian rocks, but they became extinct afterwards. They're, they never made it past the Devonian. Conodonts, uh, these kind of look like teeth, don't they? But they're not. Let me show you what they are. Um, so, conodonts, conodonts, this is what they look like, this is what a conodont looks like, and I 
I mean, they are teeth, but they're they're just a small part of the creature. These nectonic creatures called conodonts. Conodonts. So yes, they are teeth, but that's just a small part of the body. Is what I should have said. At the end of the Ordovician, we had a mass extinction. So the first mass extinction of the Paleozoic, you need to remember, is the one that occurred at the end of the Ordovician. And the next one will be the end of the Devonian. And the last one will be the end of the Permian. So we got three mass extinctions in the Paleozoic. One at the end of the Ordovician, one at the end of the Devonian, and one at the end of the Permian. The one at the end of the Ordovician wiped out many different brachiopods and bryozoans. So many... Uh, bryozoans and brachiopods survived onwards past the end of the Ordovician, but 50% um, of species um, in North America became extinct of brachiopods and bryozoans. And this is, it was triggered by global cooling at the end of the Ordovician. What period comes after the Ordovician? The Silurian. So during the Silurian and the Devonian, what you need to remember for the Silurian and the Devonian, which are the next two periods, is these were periods of major reef building. Please don't forget that. And from the Silurian onwards, reefs were dominated by corals. Corals. Phylum Cnidria, C-N-I-D-R-A-R-I-A. It's real simple, ladies and gentlemen. During the Cambrian, Archaeocyatha made up the reefs. During the Ordovician, it was mostly Bryozoa. From the Silurian all the way till today, corals dominate in the making reefs. And corals belong to Phylum Cnidria. C-N-I-D-A-R-I-A. During the Silurian Devonian, we had made more coral reefs, more reefs around our planet during any time in Earth history. And if you think about that, it's, it's quite profound. Because corals demand four conditions. Warm water, shallow water, clear water, and sunlit water. We talked about that before when we used to meet in person. And what that tells us is that since most of the planet was covered by reefs during the Silurian and Devonian, it tells us that our planet was mostly covered by an almost Caribbean-like environment. If you haven't been to the Caribbean, I'm sure you've seen pictures of the Caribbean. Or if you've been to Florida, it was a warm, shallow, clear, sunlit seas dominated. And reefs were all around our planet. Here you can see during the Devonian, for example, look at all of these different types of corals. Phylum Cnidria make up the coral reefs. Here you've got these. You should know by now what these are. What phylum do they belong to? Phylum Mollusca. What class? Class Cephalopoda. They swim. Are they benthic, planktonic, or nectonic? They are nectonic. So during the Silurian and the, De Silurian and the Devonian, there was an arthropod, phylum arthropoda, that was very common, and it was a hunter, and it hunted amongst these ancient Silurian and Devonian, in those ancient Silurian Devonian shallow seas, and it's these things here. These are called Eurypterids. And I'm going to spell that out for you. E-U-R-P-T-Y E-U-R-P-T-Y E-R-I-D-S And this shows you that they were bigger than a human being. They had pincer-like arms. 
uh, they're arthropods, phylum arthropoda. This is what one looked like. These were the hunters in those ancient Silurian and Devonian reefs. Here you can see a Eurypterid attacking an ancient type of fish. And we're going to talk about fish in the next chapter. But yes, this is phylum arthropoda. Ne these are nectonic organisms. You should be able to recognize these. They lived in the Silurian and the Devonian. They are Eurypterids. At the end of the Devonian, there was a, a, the second mass extinction that you need to remember for the Paleozoic. And it occurred due to global cooling, just as the one at the end of the Ordovician did. And it resulted in the wiping out of most of the corals. So the reefs were decimated. Now, re reefs, coral reefs, you know they require warm water. So if, it, if the planet became colder, it would have killed them, right? And maybe 90% of the coral species became extinct. Never again would corals, uh, reefs, dominate our planet. We still have reefs in the Bahamas. We have them in the Indian Ocean. We have them off of Bermuda and in the Florida Keys. But uh, the reefs were much more common during the Silurian Devonian. And at the end of the Devonian, there was global cooling, leading to our second mass extinction for the Paleozoic era. Which leads us into the last three periods of the Paleozoic. I want to see what happened to the invertebrates during the last three periods of the Paleozoic. We have, um, so we already did the Cambrian Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, and the British used Carboniferous, but the next period should be uh, Mississippian, then Pennsylvanian, then Permian. Um, he uses the British term here, he was trained in Britain. Um, Let's take a look. During the Mississippian period, which follows the Devonian, we have lots of crinoids. Do you remember what phylum these belong to? Phylum Echinodermata. Here's their necks. Here's their heads, which we call calyxes. And they're attached to the bottom of the ocean. Are they benthic, planktonic, or nectonic? They are benthic. So we got lots of crinoids during the Mississippian. That's what you want to remember. The reefs are no longer common due to that great mass extinction that occurred at the end of the Devonian period. And Pennsylvania period is basically the same. So that's why there's not another picture. You got reefs wiped out at the end of Devonian and you got crinoids quite common during the Pennsylvania and Mississippian. And by the way, those Eurypterids that you saw earlier on, they died out. Uh, at the end of the Devonian through that mass extinction. So um, if you find a Eurypterid in a, a, in a rock, sedimentary rock, you know that rock is Silurian to Devonian in age because that's when they lived. They're excellent index fossils. What is the last period of the Paleozoic? you got to remember this one. What's the last period of the Paleozoic? The Permian. So by Permian time, Some of the reefs had started to come back. So the reefs started to come back some. We, we remember from the last chapter that they were in East Texas and Oklahoma. They we find those reefs there where oil accumulates inside of these reefs after the reefs die. We talked about that. This is a sponge, phylum periphera. Look at all these benthic organisms here. Uh, here's a gastropod. Um, Things, um, the reef started to recover during the Permian. Now, something else happened um, that they didn't mention that, I, that we need to mention is we talked about phylum arthropoda, class trilobota, these trilobites, these benthic organisms. We talked about them earlier on. They're very common during the Cambrian. 
Then, during Ordovician times, the cephalopods started to feed on them, and they were less common. Um, and they were still common, but not as common as during the Cambrian. Throughout the Paleozoic, there were many things that tried to eat these trilobites. So these trilobites developed defense mechanisms. We talked about them being able to roll into a ball to protect themselves. We talked about them having compound eyes on the top of their heads so they could see above and see enemies approaching. And uh, if you see your enemy approaching, maybe you, you it gives you more time to escape. But another thing happened with these trilobites that's quite interesting is um, by Permian time, they had developed spikes on their body. Let me show you. So another defense mechanism, trilobites ended up having all these spikes toward, at the very end of the Paleozoic, in the Permian, even spikes on their eyeballs to make them harder to eat, harder to attack. Another defense mechanism. The trilobites, please don't forget, died out at the end of the Paleozoic. In other words, at the end of the Permian. You're, so there's three major mass extinctions that occurred during the Paleozoic era. First one's at the end of the Ordovician. Second one's at the end of the Devonian. But the most important one, you've got to remember this, at the end of the Permian, which represents the end of the Paleozoic, the greatest mass extinction in Earth history occurred. The greatest mass extinction, the, the greatest, uh, the closest we've ever come to Armageddon on our planet. Life was almost eliminated from planet Earth 245 million years ago. Some people call it the great die-off. What happened 245 million years ago? Permian ended, Paleozoic ended. You might also remember Pangaea came together. Pangaea came together 245 million years ago, marking the end of the Paleozoic and the beginning of the next era, the Mesozoic. The coming together of Pangaea and the great die-off, the great mass extinction 245 million years ago, is not a coincidence they occurred at the same time. The coming together of Pangaea resulted in 95% of marine invertebrate species becoming extinct. 95%. That's 19 out of 20 species of marine invertebrate species. It also represented uh, what we're going to learn later on. It, it wiped out 50% of vertebrates, too. Why did Pangaea come, the coming together of Pangaea result in a great die-off 245 million years ago. Well, when Pangaea came together, 95% of marine invertebrate species became extinct. Why? Because before Pangaea um, existed, the continents were, you had a whole bunch of different continents, right? We talked about um, there being all these different continents. And so there was a lot of living space for marine invertebrates. Each one had their own coastline. But by bringing together all of these continents, you've actually reduced the amount of continental shelf space. That means shallow ocean available for marine inver invertebrates. So organisms that um, used to have a lot of living space, a lot of acreage to live, now l they all of a sudden had... 70% less continental shelf space. So organisms, there was overcrowding. Species started to die out. And as spe when animals die, they remove oxygen from the water. And so the water became oxygen poor. And there was crowding. You can imagine that would lead to mass death. 19 out of 20 marine invertebrate species disappeared. 245 million years ago at the end of the Permian. The trilobites didn't make it. They died out 245 million years ago. The blastoids did not make it. Most of your brachiopods did not make it. Many of your cephalopods did not make it. 
But don't forget the Blastoids and the Trilobites didn't they did not survive into the Mesozoic. They died out 245 million years ago. It was a catastrophe. Later on we'll talk about why the coming together of Pangaea resulted in 50% of vertebrate species becoming extinct as well. But that is it, ladies and gentlemen. The greatest mass extinction in Earth history occurred 245 million years ago at the end of the Permian, which ended the Paleozoic era. And after that, the Mesozoic era. The extinction of the dinosaurs, we're going to talk about later on, occurred 65 million years ago. That was a big mass extinction, but it was not as big as the one that occurred 245 million years ago. So here we have them, ladies and gentlemen. There are five mass extinctions that you need to know for the final exam. The end of the Ordovician, we talked about it. The end of the Devonian, the end of the Permian. And then uh, next couple chapters, we're going to talk about dinosaurs, which existed during the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, these three periods. That's the Mesozoic era. And this last one is the Cenozoic era. We'll talk about it last. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen, for Chapter 12. Um, whatever you do, please uh, just keep watching these videos. Don't fall behind. Um, next week, we're going to get into Chapter 13. That's all for this week. Um, I will talk to you later.